All right. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. Uh, this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and this is our normal Sunday night uh, sutra and dharma conversation. Um, uh, as you know, I've been kind of giving a theme to each Dharma Doors here to each Sunday night. And to let you know, tonight's theme is going to be the idea of a Kalyana Mitra, which is normally translated as a spiritual friend. So we're going to talk about spiritual friendship, as it is called. Um, that's the theme, uh, but what this theme comes to us from a sutra. We're going to be reading a little bit from a sutra that we've been reading from for a while now. Um, the particular, uh, actually, I wanted to start with this funny idea. So the particular sutra we've been reading is a sutra that is called the, the, the Bodhisattva Manjushri's Pure Land Sutra, basically. Um, and we've been on this for a while. And I'll have more to say about the, the theme of, of a Buddha land or a pure land in a, in a minute. But in this sutra, the Buddha has been describing the kind of practices or the qualities of a bodhisattva. Like that's what has been going on. And the way this has been going on is through these series of lists. First, the Buddha gave us just one quality of a bodhisattva, and then a list of two, and then a list of three, and a list of four. And somebody reminded me uh, the other day of, it's a, I don't know who said it. If anybody knows, please uh, let us know. But it's kind of a, a, a famous quote about Buddhism. And the quote is, um, there's no God in Buddhism, but there's a lot of lists. <laughs> and so I wanted to actually say something to start. Um, so tonight we are, we're actually, we've gotten up to the list of nine qualities of the Bodhisattva. So we're going to talk about nine dharmas. We're going to talk about nine things uh, tonight. Um, and uh, there's a theme of these nine, and it's this idea of the spiritual friend. But what I wanted to say about the list is like, yeah, what is with Buddhism and all these lists, right? It's just, they're everywhere. And, you know, there's a lot that to, there's a lot I could say about this. I could probably talk the whole night just about the idea of lists. I just wanted to point this out though. I was kind of thinking about it, like thinking about it this way, thinking about it that way. And, and then something really, really clear just dawned on me. And at first, what it was, was a top 10 list. We love top 10 lists, right? That's the idea. We love a good list. We love three easy steps to da 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 we don't like endless amounts of information like a tome of a book we actually like bullets bullet points and bullets and lists and things so these lists are everywhere and again if you just think kind of more broadly about you know even in a way just the internet so many lists in so many ways and it's what people look for and they look for lists because of this quick, easy access to information, right? Because you don't, again, you don't want to read a whole giant book just to pick out a movie. You want the top 10 movies this year type of a thing. So tonight, I guess you could say, <laughs> we're, this is the nine easy steps to purifying your Buddha land, right? So um, again, that's the theme of the sutra is how a bodhisattva purifies their Buddha land. And uh, yeah, let, let me say a few words about that because I haven't mentioned it for a while. Again, this whole sutra is about pure uh, uh, Buddha lands, purifying Buddha lands. And let me just kind of mention 
how you might think about that. You could think about it very simply. And what I mean by that is, if the, the practice of Buddhism, if the Dharma is a kind of, oh, a psychological process of clearing out a lot of habitual gunk from the mind, <laughs> Right. So I just I just put that in a very, you know, 21st century kind of, a, you know, psychological way, clearing out the gunk or the no clearing out the habitual gunk of the mind. Right. And, you know, again, that's a very modern way to, to speak. And what I'm getting at is, is that I think there's a very beautiful, poetic way that some Buddhists, some sutras, some Buddhist texts, they talk about that same thing of clearing out the habitual gunk of the mind, but they talk about it in terms of purifying one's Buddha land. And the underlying idea there is that each and every one of us in that sense is a Buddha, is, is actually residing in their own Buddha land right now, but our Buddha lands might need a little work, right? <laughs> it's a fixer upper of a Buddha land in that way. And so the idea of getting to work uh, on that is purifying one's Buddha land. And so the very, the lists that we've been hearing about have been all these lists of ways that bodhisattvas can purify their Buddha lands, put it that way. Um, and so tonight we're going to find out to get these nine easy steps to do that. Um, there's a lot of overlap with this list with the other lists. And I'll use that as an opportunity to say, you know, these, these lists are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> there's a lot of overlap. And the idea is, is that we are approaching the same information different ways. Now, tonight, it's going to be nine ways to approach this information. And actually, before we even get to the lists, so, yeah, because this is the theme tonight is this idea of spiritual friendship, Kalyana Mitras, and this doesn't actually occur until the kind of the end of the list. And I wouldn't want to not talk about this. So I'm going to actually start with a quick few words about this idea, where this idea of spiritual friends comes from, what, again, what it kind of means. Then we'll start tackling our, our lists in that way. Um, so as you know, for a while in the Dharma doors here, for a very long time, actually, I've only been teaching and reading and, and explaining Mahayana Buddhist sutras. I, I work a lot with the Pali Canon. I, I have taught a lot from the Pali Canon and the early suttas, but I myself am way more drawn to these Mahayana sutras. And I'll tell you right away that this idea of the Kalyana Mitra, the, having a spiritual friend or spiritual friends, it's a very kind of important part of Mahayana Buddhism. And you don't really hear about it so much in the, in the earlier path, the so-called Hinayana or what would be called the Theravada. And I'll give you a really simple reason why that is. If you read all of the Pali suttas, from that early Buddhist tradition, they are all given by the Buddha. And they are presenting themselves as records of the teachings that the Buddha gave, meaning these, the early Sangha, they had the Buddha, <laughs> they had the teacher. Um, and so there was a Sangha that was learning from the Buddha, from the teacher. The Mahayana Buddhist tradition is very much a post-Buddha movement. 
Mahayana Buddhism is, it develops, it emerges, it, its practices, everything about it presumes that the Buddha is gone. And we're, we're, we're left without that teacher in a way. And so the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, it really encourages and, and um, well, it encourages and supports this idea of having spiritual friends, these Kalyana Mitra. And, you know, Mitra, that word Mitra, is it's related to the word metta and you probably know the word metta loving kindness but metta is actually closer to friend friendliness yes it means kindness loving kindness but the word metta is about friendliness mitra is a friend and mitreya is the friendly one the name of the future coming buddha actually so just to give you a little language there so the root of maitreya mitreya is this mitra a friend but here's the thing about it these well let me actually i'll share with you one of the main sources if you were going to go looking into kalyana mitra and you wanted to know what these were all about there's one sutra that is like the place to go for what is a Kalyana Mitra? And that sutra is called, it's called the Ganda Vyuha Sutra. Um, this uh, beautiful array of manifestations sutra. It also, by the way, is part of this ginormous sutra that I'm often talking about. So this is the Avatamsaka or the, the Bhuttavatamska Saka Sutra, this flower ornament sutra. So this is probably the basically the biggest sutra there is, very Mahayana. And as you can see, it's in three volumes. And the entire third volume is kind of a sutra all by itself. And by itself, it would be called the Gandavyuha Sutra. And it's really an interesting sutra. It is, it reads like something out of Tolkien. <laughs> it is a, a really interesting story about a, um, well, we could call him a bodhisattva. It doesn't start as a bodhisattva. But in the story, he actually makes the Bodhisattva vow, and Sudhana is his name, and Sudhana goes to Manju Shri. Of all the Bodhisattvas, he goes to Manju Shri, and in this this sutra, which again is very long, Manju Shri, the the Bodhisattva of wisdom, sends Sudhana on a spiritual journey. And what happens is, is, let's see, can I read, I'll read a little bit of this to you. So then our Manjushri says to our spiritual seeker, Sudhana, it is good that you think and have set your heart on supreme awakening that you should find out the practices of bodhisattvas. It's hard to find beings who have set their hearts on supreme awakening. It's even harder to find beings who, once they have set their minds on awakening, seek the practices of a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva is a, is a certain to attain this awakening through true spiritual friends, Kalyana Mitra, spiritual friends, for the realization of awakening. So Manjushri tells Sudhana to go seek these 52 different Kalyana Mitra. So these become these 
spiritual friends of Sudhana. And he goes from one to the next to the next, again, in a really um, interesting story. I've never read a sutra like that, where it's such a narrative, where it's really just these the story of this uh, pilgrim's progress, if you will. And here's the thing about these Kalyana Mitra. Yes, they are teachers. Each one of these 52 Kalyana Mitra teaches Sudhana something. But the important thing that we find out, or it's not what we find out, but you one does find it out when you read that sutra. It's it's a very, it's in very much in keeping with the teachings that no one of these teachers becomes Sudhana's exclusive teacher. It's actually about him learning a little bit from this person and then moving on to this and learning a little bit from them. And actually the story is about Sudhana eventually not needing a teacher. And at that point, spoiler alert, <laughs> Sudhana becomes a Buddha. <laughs> so that is a Bodhisattva's journey all the way from making the initial determination for awakening all the way to that very awakening. But by going through and meeting all of these different spiritual friends, and some of them are more teachers than others, by which I mean some of them really provide formal Dharma teaching in that way, but others serve more as support in that way. And when I, when I read that, and there, this happens in a lot of Mahayana sutras, that one's just sort of the best one. But when I read that, I think a lot of the San Francisco Dharma Collective and other such wonderful Dharma organizations where it's this support network for the path. And it's not about, you know, idol worship and about this sort of um, guru worship in that way, in that very exclusive way, that it's more about fostering and learning from this person, that tradition here and there. So I just want you to know that that's when this comes up in the sutra in a little bit, that's what they're talking about. These types of, um, well, again, spiritual friends. And I want to really, you know, emphasize this language of friend, because I would very much prefer to be your friend in that way than a teacher in that sense, in any kind of hierarchical formal way. Um, so, because as I often say on Sunday nights, I get, I learn and get just as much out of this as you may. So, spiritual friendship. <laughs> okay, so again, that was just a kind of a quick little intro to the idea of this. It's going to come back in a little bit, but I wanted to make sure we talked about it. Um, let's get into our list because I do have a kind of little Dharma talk prepared based on the contents of this. So, um, the Buddha says to Shariputra, the monk who's receiving all these teachings, Bodhisattvas who achieve nine things will be certain to purify their Buddha land. What nine? One, a disciplined body. Two, disciplined speech. And three, disciplined thoughts. I'm going to just work with those right now. There's three more, of course, and then there's three more, but they are given sort of in sets of three. So a disciplined body, disciplined speech, and a disciplined mind. So a couple of different ideas going on there. Um, the first, let's just talk about body, speech, and mind. So these, of course, are the three sources of karma as they would say. And of course, you, I want you to remember that within the world of Buddhism, karma just means activity, movement, action. It's not about, you know, this 
karmic reward and reciprocity thing. It's actually just about movement of the body or movement of the voice or thinking or which is to say movement of the mind. So those are the three sources of activity, karma. And in general, we sort of have two modes of working with body, speech, and mind. A disciplined mode or an out of control, mindless mode. <laughs> That's sort of what we're dealing with here. And so that brings us to the second part of this, which is the idea of discipline. <clears throat> So as, as you know too, or as you may know, there's a few different um, English, or there's one English translation of this sutra, and I'm doing my own translation from the Chinese. The only difference in language here is the Tibetan, they talk about a restrained body, restrained speech and restrained mind. Whereas the Chinese, it's more the formal language of discipline. This language of discipline, by the way, you might know the word, it's vinaya or vinaya. That's literally the word for a, to discipline or train. And so, of course, the Buddhist project or aspect of Buddhism is the disciplining or controlling. Uh, you also sometimes see the language of taming but taming the body, taming speech, and then taming the mind. So I want to say a few things about taming and what it means to have a disciplined body, speech, and mind. But before that, before we look at those three, I want to kind of just talk about an interesting thing regarding those three sources of karma. So the basic idea, of course, is, well, it's a really subtle point, but I've, I have found that making this subtle point is helpful. So it has to do with how, so the body here is physical, meaning it's out here in the the gross physical world as they would say and what that means is is that the karmic activity is very um um out there <laughs> it's very obvious like if i push something it moves right it's like this, this kind of physical activity and what i mean by that is that the results of physical karmic activity are rather immediate. When we do something, there's an effect in that way. So physical bodily activity, it's, it's gross. And of course, I don't mean icky, but I mean, it's out there, it's happening, and the karmic effects are rather immediate in that sense. Now, I actually want to jump over <laughs> speech for a moment. And I want to just go right to activity of the mind. Activity of the mind, of course, is way more subtle. It's not gross in, in the sense of out there. It's very subtle, which is the opposite of gross in that sense. So it's very subtle. And there's a way in which the affect the karmic results, the results of the karmic activity of the mind, well, they can be, they can pop up much later, so to speak. It, the, a simple example would be, you see something during the day and don't pay it any mind, but then that night you have a dream about it. That would be sort of the karmic effect, mental karmic effect, taking a while to rear itself in that sense. So the mind is much more subtle. The main thing that I want to point out, though, is that it, it's not tangible. You can't take an idea and put it on a scale. It doesn't have it doesn't weigh anything. 
It doesn't have a color, a shape, or a size. It's an idea. Okay, so that's the karma of the body versus the karma of the mind. And that divide, by the way, the body mind divide, that of course, philosophically, is a very, very interesting philosophical question. What is the relationship between the physical and the mental? Is the mental just an aspect of the physical? Is the physical just an aspect of the mental? Interesting philosophical questions arise from what is called the mind body problem. This is age old philosophy, by the way, the mind body problem. It's fun to think about, but I'm actually here to make it even more fun to think about. <laughs> and I want to make it more fun to think about that by speaking of that other aspect of karma, the voice. So the voice and, you know, when Buddhism and even pretty much just Indian philosophy, when they talk about vocal karma, they're, they're talking about communication. And what's interesting is, is that what I'm about to say regarding speech, regarding the voice, it goes for writing as well, but so it's about communicating in a way, but I'm going to focus on vocal speech. I'll try to remember to, to point out about written speech, but here's the thing about speech. There's an aspect of talking that is physical, that is gross and that's out there. And what that physical aspect of speaking is, is the actual sound of the word, like the literal sound. But there's a mental aspect to speech, which is what those sounds mean. And so the idea is, is that I could say, I could say the word all right, I, actually, I already cheated. I could make the sound car, car. And one aspect of that is just the guttural k, the, the vowel, uh, and then this r sound, car. So there's just the sound. But if you're imagining something with wheels and a steering wheel on a road that's a car and what i want you to be noticing is is that if somebody didn't speak english they too would hear car but only an english speaker would then think of a car so speech is weird because it's part physical and part mental. It's actually from a certain Buddhist point of view, speech is the bridge between the physical and the mental. By which I mean this thing that it has a physical component, but it has a mental component. It's, it's literally kind of in between the two worlds. So speech is a wild activity in that sense. So now, anybody have any questions or comments, answers, ideas about the subtlety of speech there? So now, oh, oh I will uh, finish that. Writing. Writing is also physical in that it has the marks, you know, the, the actual physical marks on a page, but it is a mind that deciphers those symbols into meaning and into words and language. So the same thing is going on where there's a physical component to writing and language, 
but then a mental thing that happens that gets kind of magically unlocked through speech or through writing. So now, oh, and by the way, given that speech karma, it, it's not as immediate as physical karma, or at least the sound is. Your, your ears hear it immediately. That's how physical karma is very instant. But it might be a while before you understand it. So there's like a little lag time there. So, but it's not as slow and subtle as just mental karma. And then what happens is just one last piece of this puzzle. What is often said, not just in Buddhism, but it's kind of said a lot just within general yoga, uh, yoga traditions. But what they say is the things that one thinks tend to be the things that one talks about. And the things that one thinks and talks about are the things that one does. So it's usually like, oh, I'm going to go to the store as a thought. And then, hey, honey, I'm going to go to the store. <laughs> and then pretty soon I'm going to the store with my body. And so the, all the, the reality <laughs> of finding myself going to the store begins with the mental transitioning to a language, which by the way, could include the internal dialogue, the language that we communicate to ourselves with in that sense. And then that then kind of percolates or bubbles up into manifest reality. Okay, so that's a few words about bodily karma, or just actions of the body, actions of the voice, and actions of the mind, by which I mean thinking in that sense. Now, in order to purify our Buddha land, a bodhisattva is advised to discipline or train their body, their voice, and their mind. So bodily, tra the training of the body, in at least the early Buddhist tradition, more or less also in the bodhisattva path as well, but discipline of the physical body was very much about most of the precepts, <laughs> meaning most of those kind of Buddhist prohibitions against killing, stealing, lying is going to be vocal karma. So we'll just hold on to that for a moment. But ahimsa, or actually breaking ahimsa, so being violent, taking what is not given, sexual misconduct, and the taking of intoxicants. Those are four physical things that we could have a tendency to do in that way. And so the discipline that they're talking about is that controlling of that behavior. And, you know, it's different, obviously, for everybody. Everybody has their different relationship to those different things, by which I mean sex, intoxicants, stuff, like you, you like stuff so much you're willing to, to steal it in that way. And then anger, hostility, violence, all of that. There is a, ten, a tendency, a habit of the human being. And by the way, it's not just the human being, but there is a streak in many creatures, if not all creatures, which is that if you antagonize me enough, it'll get violent. <laughs> That's part of the idea. Now, what I want to make really clear if, if this is your first time hearing about the Dharma, Buddhism is very aware of, you know, what would be called evolutionary biology. It's very aware of these tendencies. And by the way, it's very aware of the necessity of these tendencies, at least the role that these things served in the past 
in order to protect the the creature in that sense so what i mean is is that there's a habit and you can notice it in the 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 like a really you know a, a newly born mammal most newly born mammals if you get too close to it it'll go ah. it'll bare its teeth make noises and say get away and in some mammals if you don't heed the warning of the ah, ah, get away it could get violent in that sense so that tendency to get angry to get mad to say get away from me and then to even get physical if you want that thing or whatever to go away again the idea is is that that is a habit that is an a habit of evolution if you want to call it that so buddhism recognizes that this is sort of a trait but the idea is the idea is, is that there was a particular mammal, a particular mammal that reached a certain point at consciousness to where it could turn back on itself and understand why it was getting angry in the first place, what it was trying to do to, in terms of getting angry. And what I mean by that is the the mind of a bodhisattva, a mind of the, one of these awakened beings that is looking back on this process, that mind says, oh, I see how baring my teeth, making noises and getting angry, I see how that is helpful in certain situations. But the problem is from a Buddhist point of view, is that we have learned and by we i don't mean you i don't mean me i'm talking about the human species in that sense we have learned that if we feel in danger we should get mad that's what we're trained to do do i i feel in danger i should get mad that'll do it the problem is, is that we live in this crazy modern world where we don't actually even know what we're afraid of. We don't even, we know we're afraid. We know that. And so we get mad. We have a tendency to get mad because we're programmed to do that. But the idea is, is that the program is just running on autopilot and it's out of control, causing us all to suffer because we're not actually in danger that way. We're in, maybe not even in danger at all, actually. But my point is, is that these are habits to get angry and then maybe to get violent. And so the Buddhist, the Bodhisattva makes a vow, decides, you know what? I'm going to control that. That's, that would be really noble of me to use Buddhist terminology. That's why they call it the, the noble eightfold path and this idea of becoming an Arya or a noble one. It's the idea that to be disciplined in the body and to like have control over that is noble. And to be mindless and reactionary and freaking out is not noble in that sense. So that's an idea of disciplining the body. Another example that I wanna give you taking what's not given, right? So otherwise known as stealing. So that one is not about anger. That one's about desire. That's about the wanting. Again, wanting so much that you're willing to just take it in that sense, right? So here's the thing, another thing, another way to look at it. Maybe, probably, 10, 20, 30,000 years ago, it was probably a really good idea in terms of self-survival. It was probably a good idea to hoard things. You know, 
you come across some nuts, you come across some this, and you create a little, a little bundle of it, and you have a habit of hoarding, you have a habit of gathering and hoarding food, that probably gets you through the winter. That's probably a good idea to do that. So once again, it would seem that we are programmed and conditioned to hoard in order to survive. So now fast forward 10, 20, 30,000 years and our bodies, do, or yeah, the biology in that sense, our bodies don't know about grocery stores and fast food and government subsidies that are paying farmers to not grow food because it's like we're so far past the need to hoard food in that way. But what's going on, perhaps from this bodhisattva point of view, is that the creature feels safe with hoarding. And so we find ourselves with a garage stuffed full of all kinds of stuff that we don't need, but it makes us feel safer. Why would that make us feel safer to have a bunch of stuff? Could it just be a holdover of biology in that way? And that at this point, all of that stuff is making us suffer and not actually making us feel safer. But because the hoarding tendency is supposed to make me feel safer, I'll go get more stuff because it's not working, right? And so I must not have enough stuff. And you could see how that mentality would just keep spinning out of control to where you're like, well, I, I'm still not safe. I'm still not happy. Better get more. And so the idea is, is that the controlling of that desire to need and want to the point where you would steal in that way. Sexuality, of course, is another one in terms of absolutely the nobility of controlling that behavior and the un -ill, Ill nobility of not being able to control that behavior. So that's the idea. But again, from an evolutionary point of view, it makes sense to have an uncontrollable libido. Just putting it, just saying. <laughs> but the idea here is, is that unless you want to have a zillion, zillion children, <laughs> then it's probably just causing suffering in that way. So I hope you get my point about disciplining the body. Why would one want to discipline the body to control these habits in that way? Disciplining of the speech, that was number two, the number two practice of the bodhisattva here. I kind of already mentioned it. The primary one is about false speech in that way. But the Buddha actually, or Buddhism, it has a long list of bad speech, harsh speech, idle chit chat is considered kind of bad speech in that way. Um, so there's a whole variety of ways that we can ab use our voice. And the idea here is, of course, is that a lot like the bodily things I was talking about, the idea that they might be habits that we are just very, very deeply conditioned to perform and actually not performing them is the move. Similarly, there's a way in which a lot of speech is, um, I guess nowadays we say of people that they have no filter, right? That idea that just whatever is thought of is said, and that might be harsh, and I might regret saying it, but it just came out. Oh, sorry, I said that. Well, the idea is, is that a bodhisattva is working on not having random things come out of their mouth, <laughs> but actually being mindful of speech in that way and asking is that could this be construed as harsh? Is this pointless, what I'm about to say? 
Another one, divisive speech. It's a big one in Buddhism. Speech that causes divides. So you ask yourself, is this divisive? Like intentionally divisive or not? Asking oneself, is this going to create a kind of divide? And so those are a few of the many ways that we can ab use our speech in that sense. And then, of course, taking vows or being mindful of the way that we use our speech. I often like to point out regarding speech, it's so powerful, our voice, in ways that you know, we have no idea how powerful it is. And the one example that I like to give a lot is, especially if you, if you uh, live with somebody, if you have a partner, if you have a spouse, but the way in which in the morning, the things you say, they can really make or break someone's day. Like if you get up and you, you know, paid your partner or whoever a compliment and it, it could send them on a very good day. But if the first thing they hear is, you know, me complaining about whatever, 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 it could really send that, that person's whole day in a bad direction. And it would all be from what I chose to say or not. That's very powerful. That's very, very powerful. And so I think the being mindful of speech in that way, noticing, and, and again, kind of being aware of the effects what one is about to say might have, that's disciplined speech. And then number three, disciplined thought, disciplined mind. Now, of course, as I said, this is the subtlest form of karmic activity, right? And oh boy, <laughs> if you thought a lot of the behaviors of the body were habitual, and if you thought a lot of the things coming out of your mouth might be habitual, well, a lot of the thinking and the ways of thinking are habitual in that sense. They are tendencies, they are volitional formations in that sense, or samskara. And so the thing about disciplining the mind, whew, that's a tricky one. And the reason why I say that is, is because, you know, being aware of the activities of the body and being like, like you were about to go steal something. And then you were like, ah, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. Or as I was just saying, maybe you're about to say something, but then you think, you know, that might cause a division. I'll just keep that to myself. In both of those cases, whether it's the body or speech, I mentioned there being this mind that's noticing what one is about to do, noticing what one is about to say. How do you get on top of thinking and notice what one is about to think? That's why the mind training, the, the mental discipline is, is tricky. It's tricky because of needing or requiring that very disposition on thinking itself. How, oh, how could one acquire such a disposition on thinking itself? I wonder, I wonder if there isn't some technique, some method of sitting still and noticing, oh yeah, that's right, meditation or mindfulness as it's called. That's a really good way to develop a reflective observation of thinking itself. And the idea of that, of course, is like I just said, one might habitually, uh, you know, I think, well, what's it, uh, um, uh, kleptomania, 
right? Kleptomania is the uncontrollable habit of just stealing, right? Oh, I, whoops, I stole your stuff, sorry. But it's that idea of an uncontrollable habit of stealing. Again, what I want you to notice is that there's one way of being in the world, totally out of control, totally mindless, totally habitual, just, just totally habituated and behaving just out of habit versus this disciplined mode. And this discipline mode requires that perspective. It requires mindfulness in that sense. So the idea is, is that those habits of the body, those habits of speech, they're all stemming from these habits of the mind. And so the, the importance of this mind training or disciplining the mind and the basic way, and this gets complicated, but we have a few more things to talk about tonight. So the basic idea of disciplining the mind, it's mainly, not entirely, but it's mainly about the ability to focus, by which I mean the ability to stay with something. It doesn't matter what it is. The breath is the usual one, but it could be a lot of things. But we're talking about distractibility. So let's just say that there was, you know, there's even in some uh, Zen, some Zen Buddhist traditions, they like to use just a single point on the wall in front of you. You zero in on a single spot and with laser like focus, you just try to attend to that spot. But what will invariably happen, of course, is that something will distract us. Either something will physically distract us in the physical world, and it'll be like, ooh, what was that? Or, ooh, what was that? Or it might be something voice, somebody might say something to us, or we might hear something in that regard that will then disturb us from our focus on that point. Or it could be the very mind itself that goes wandering about, thinking about whatever, whatever, whatever. And then you remember, oh, I was trying to stay focused on that point at the wall. It's almost as if we, we don't have control over our own mind. A disciplined mind would be able to train itself on a single point for as long as it would like to observe that point, undisturbed. That level of mind training, of focus, is difficult to acquire, and it takes time in that sense. But my point is, with all three of these, it's about habits and just going with the flow of those habits versus actually mindfully getting on top of those habits. And mindfully getting on top of those habits is what makes those habits dissipate. That's the teaching. So everybody feeling okay with those? Excellent. So those were the first three ways for a bodhisattva to purify their Buddha land, right? Disciplining the body, disciplining the speech, and disciplining the mind. The next three uh, achievements, if you will, of a bodhisattva that will purify their Buddha land is the cessation of all craving. Number five, the cessation of all anger. And number six, the cessation of all confusion. So once again, we have a set of three, and these three should sound familiar. These are the three afflictions, the three kleshas, 
three poisons, the three root causes, greed, anger, and confusion, otherwise known as delusion. So these are those three afflictions of the mind. The first of them, again, is craving. The word is tanha, and tanha literally means thirst. This wanting, this craving, this desiring, that is one of the afflictions, and it is to be ceased in that sense. Um, the second is usually aversion, but anger is also a way to translate it. And then this third is, again, ignorance, confusion, or delusion. Those three are the, the I call them the malware of the mind. The idea of these three is that they are not endogenous to the mind. They are foreign entities that have afflicted us in that way. And so the Buddhist process, in many ways, what disciplining the body, speech, and mind leads to is the cessation of these three afflictions. So I want to talk a little bit about I want to present a scenario to describe these three poisons, as they're sometimes called. And just to kind of give you a, I don't know, just a way that I think about these three. So the scenario that I want to present is it's the idea that you or somebody, it doesn't need to be you, whatever, but just somebody you can imagine somebody has a dream and what happens in that dream is they they find themselves in this really cool cafe it's like an old converted church it you know it's got this beautiful stained glass windows and it's just it's really cool and you're having a dream or somebody's having a dream in which they find themselves in this really cool place. And the, it's a coffee shop or a cafe and they're drinking this coffee and it's really good. And it's like, this is, they're having a great time. And then they notice in the window, a sign that says for lease the cafe, the church is for lease. Now, remember, we're in a dream. Remember that. But this person forgets, doesn't know they're in a dream. And they see the for lease sign. And they start thinking, I could lease this. And they start plotting. Yeah, and they get they start creating this really, really great idea where they're going to they were planning on selling their house anyways, but they were like, oh, I could sell my house and use that as the equity and I could lease this cafe. That would be so cool. And so they start plotting this big plan to acquire this cafe. And then in the process, so they're sitting there and this is all happening, you know, in their mind where they're like, oh, this is going to be great. And then a realtor comes in the cafe and they're, they're showing the cafe to a potential buyer. And now all of a sudden, you're, you don't want that person to buy it, but it looks like they're going to buy it. And so you start getting angry at the person who's going to buy the cafe. So all of this is going on. And by the way, the whole time that this is happening, there's like this old guy in the corner drinking coffee. And he keeps telling you, come on, just sit down. Just enjoy it. 
but you've got these big plans to acquire the building and then you'll be happy when it's my building because i got these big ideas to turn it into a music venue slash cafe and i got all these ideas so let's just say this dream goes on for a while and it's this whole big ordeal with the realtor and this other person and ah, da, 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 right the whole time that old guy's like come on just have a seat and then you wake up and what i want you to think about now is this person upon waking i want you to notice how they got very very worked up they got very very excited they got very very angry and both both of those things getting very excited about the idea of buying the building and getting very angry at the idea of not being able to acquire the building. I want you to notice how both of those moved the person out of the mindset of being in this really cool environment and enjoying themselves. They took themselves out of enjoyment and started hatching all of these ideas about how they could be happier. And it was that very idea that made them not do that. And again, all the while, there was that old guy that was telling you, it's a dream. Just sit down and enjoy it. Well, that's the basic Buddhist teaching regarding greed and anger. Those two emotions, the emotion of give me more and the emotion of get that away from me, it's those two emotions that afflict, that's why they call them the afflictions, that afflict the mind and cause this suffering and ultimately are what push are what are pushing us out of having a good time. And this is what like the kind of the way that I like to teach Buddhism is that the Buddha wants us to be having a much better time that we're than we're having <laughs> like really <laughs> like that's the idea and i say that in you know in reaction to any idea that buddhism is a very dour lifeless like tradition it's no it's actually a very buoyant joyful tradition and again, the idea is, is that we're not having as good a time as we could be having in that sense. Now, those two, the desire and the aversion, or the anger in that sense, both of those were coming from the same place. And that same place was confusion or delusion, that third affliction. And you know what the third affliction was? Believing the cafe was real. Believing that you, he, the person believed that they could acquire the cafe. And from believing that that was possible, that's where all of those other ideas came from. The idea of how much happier I could be if I owned this non-existent building, right? the anger at that person because they're going to own the non-existent building. <laughs> so the idea is, is that the confusion of the delusion is primarily about uh, fancy language. It's about the imputing of existence, not existence, but existence things things that exist that's called an ex existent something that is existent and the imputing of existence things existing as those things that's the confusion like a dream and then from the fabricating or imputing of things existing now we can want them or be angry about them. But I want you to notice how greed and anger 
they only work when there's something or somebody there to get angry or be averse. So confusion or delusion or even ignorance, as it sometimes might be called, is a really you know, important affliction to pay attention to in that sense. All right, are we doing good with those? Excellent. So the next three bring us to the theme for tonight. I know it's a little late, but I'm glad we already talked a little bit about it. So the next three have to do with, with this idea of Kalyana Mitra, these spiritual friends. The seventh uh, accomplishment or practice of the Bodhisattva here is not practicing deception, specifically not being deceptive. And it's, it's the exact same in both the Tibetan and the Chinese. Number eight is being a true or solid friend. And number nine is to not despise Kalyana Mitra, not despise spiritual friends or spiritual teachers in that way. Those are the last three of these qualities of a Bodhisattva that will purify their Buddha land. So because the first three are the three sources of karma and the next three are the three afflictions, it seems appropriate to put these last three together. The seventh one, which is this idea of not practicing deception, you know, usually that would fall under speech, not being, not lying or deceptive speech in that way. But I do think that this um, seventh one here, that this one, it's sort of a, it would include speech, but I think it would be, um, it's, it just from the language, it sounds like it's a much more all embodied form of deception. So just, you know, being deceptive with speech, being deceptive all around. And the practice is, is not to do that. I guess that what I want to point out is, is that if we interpret this as having to do with friendship, <laughs> because the next two have to do with friendship. It makes sense to me how it's a good practice of friends and, fr and friendship to not be deceptive, that that's like a good way to create harmony among friends. I would want to point out though, just the general, like I've, I've said, I've pointed this out before. It's something to notice about lying or about deception. I've noticed it in myself, it be, a big part of my practice is, mm, you know, going anywhere from being when I was much younger and being like very, very intentionally deceptive. I'm thinking basically like maybe towards my parents, right? Or whatever. But the idea of like being actually very deceptive to my parents in that way, then I got a little older, grew up, as they would say, and now my lies became a little bit different, but they were still there in a way. And then maybe, you know, cross fingers, maybe my practice has been paying off. And now it's a kind of a little white lie every now and then kind of a thing. The one thing that I've noticed reflecting upon my behavior as a kid, reflecting upon my behavior as a young adult and reflecting on my behavior now, I've noticed how lying, there's always a sense of self there that's being, or we feel, I feel as if I'm preserving or almost protecting a certain idea of myself. It's what, you know, even if you go back to the idea of like, where were you last night? My parents ask. And I say, oh, I was at my friend, you know, I was at Gabe's house. But I wasn't. 
but I'm trying to preserve in their mind the idea that I'm a good kid and I didn't go to the party, that I was just up the street. But notice how the lying has to do with a self there, that one is trying to, you know, you're trying to mold in your impression in other people's minds in that sense. And I just want you to notice from that Buddhist point of view how it has a lot to do with notions of self in that way. And then from an even more problematic point of view, if you really look at lying, ah, from a Buddhist point of view, it's really bad because not only is it about a deluded sense of self, you're not even willing to own up to your deluded sense of self, so you're fabricating this other deluded sense of self, <laughs> right? Because again, from a Buddhist point of view, even our most honest sense of ourself is a fabricated delusion. <laughs> so if we're then creating other versions of the, it, again, it's just nonsense from that point of view. And the basic idea, of course, for the Bodhisattva here is to not practice doing that. By the way, I, I do want to point out that in the Chinese, at least, I, again, I don't have the original Tibetan, so I don't know the exact language. But in the Chinese, it is specifically this idea of practicing deception. Because there is a way that if you do it, you can get better and better and better and better at it. So the idea is not to even practice it in that way. And then the last two, which are specifically about friendship. The first one is about oneself and the idea of oneself being, and this is where the language is interesting. I guess the mo at least from the Chinese, the most literal translation would be that a bodhisattva in order to purify their Buddha land should be a stable, friend. But if you know the language, if you know the Chinese, the, the characters, it, it would be like, um, it would be like a, uh, some sort of um, support of some sort. And if I were to go up to it and lean against it, and it just fell right over, and it couldn't hold me up, that wouldn't be stable. So you want to be a bodhisattva wants to be a friend that people can rely on in that sense, like lean, lean against, right? Like that, like that great song, the lean on me song, like that idea, a bodhisattva is somebody that one can lean on in that way. And so that's a practice of a bodhisattva to be a stable, supportive friend. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. And then the last of this is our Kalyanamitra, our, our explicitly mentioned Kalyanamitra. And I think the language was also the same in both the Chinese. Ah, the Tibetan was not being disrespectful to Kalyanamitra. So that brings us full circle here to this idea of our spiritual friend. Again, what I want to kind of mention is that in the early form of Buddhism, if you read those sutras, the idea was is that the Buddha was there and everybody could rely on the Buddha. Everybody could go for refuge to the Buddha. But then the Buddha passes away and this thing called Buddhism starts right? And this thing called Buddhism is kind of on its own. They don't have the Buddha. So for a while, you have the idea of the Sangha, the spiritual community. You have the idea of the Dharma, the teachings, and you had sort of the memory of the Buddha. And those are the three jewels. Those are the, that's the triple gem, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And that's sort of what held Buddhism together 
for a while. But again, these sutras, the Mahayana sutras, come to us from a little bit later, and they're very much from a time when, again, there was no Buddha, but even the texts, even the Dharma, even the Sangha was beginning to change. And so you have the emergence of this, like, well, again, it, it, it's tricky because in the modern world, in the modern world, Buddhism, certain types of Buddhism especially, have become very guru-centric. Like that idea of this one teacher for life, this is my guru for life. Um, that way of being religious in that sense, you know, that is a very Indian way of doing yoga. It's a very Indian way of, of practicing, which is you have one teacher, one guru for your whole life. And then even when that guru passes away, you have a picture of that guru and they're still your guru in that way. And I guess what I want to mention, yeah, I have just a few minutes. I want to mention this. These, um, oh yeah, that reminds me, there was something about the Gandavyuha Sutra I wanted to mention. So the sutra that I just read from, the, this Manjushri's Pure Land Sutra, it comes from a large collection of sutras called the Maharatnakuta. And the Maharatnakuta is very related to this ginormous Avatamsaka Sutra. They're all part of the same kind of family. And there's a lot of things I really like about that type of Buddhism. You, I guess you could call it early Mahayana Buddhism. It doesn't exist in the world, by the way, anymore. We just have the texts, we have the sutras, and we have historical records of these Buddhist communities. But even if you just read the sutras from the, these Buddhist communities, you immediately get the sense of this Kalyanamitra, this idea of it's not, it's this group of peers, this, this group of, of people learning from each other in that way. And the one really important thing that I wanna point out that I forgot to earlier. So in this Gandavyuha Sutra that I mentioned, that's the go-to place to learn about Kalyanamitras, our hero, truly it's a kind of a hero's journey, Sudhana, the, the hero of this, he goes to all these 52 teachers. And what I want you to know that's very special and very important is that many, many, many of those 52 teachers are women in the sutra. And that is something that is kind of unique to this particular type of Buddhism, this early Mahayana Buddhism. I would throw, if you've ever, I did, I taught a course, or not a course, but I did a Dharma Doors on the lion's roar of Queen Srimala a while ago. And that was the story about a female, a woman, a, a queen who is basically a Buddha. That sutra is from this family. The Maharatnakuta that I'm reading from tonight is from that family. And in them, you find these very, very, you know, strong, wise female teachers. And Buddhism, you know, some schools of Buddhism have a better relationship with sex and gender than others. Let's put it that way. Some have a terrible relationship to sex and gender. Some of them have a very enlightened approach to sex and gender. And I put these in that family. And it's interesting because they, it's, well, that's at, too late for me to go down that road, but it's from a very dharmic, point of view. It's from a very dharmic point of view that these sutras celebrate female teachers. Let me put it to you that way. Because basically to discriminate would be not dharmic. <laughs> and so they, they really uh, 
practice the Dharma that they preach in that way. So, all right, Kalyanamitra, um, any questions, comments, answers, ideas, epiphanies, realizations? All right, then that's gonna conclude the nine steps to purifying your Buddha land. And that's right, next week we will hear the 10 steps to purifying your Buddha land. <laughs>